All right, Treacle. People keep asking if I'm back, and I haven't really had an answer. But now, yeah, I'm thinking I'm back. <laughs> actually can bring in some actual money rather than just you know only selling the players that aren't worth anything much you know like the El Nenis of this world the Klazanaches of this world and people like that, that we're not going to get much money for then we're going to find it hard to improve the squad we'd have to sell it we have to get rid of all of them whereas if we can get if we can actually sell some of the players that we could still get some reasonably good money for I say such as maybe Saliba such as Pepe Lacazette as you said still worth um, some money, I think, it, you know, you said 20, 25 million for him, probably. So we, we could, if we can raise some decent funds that way, then we've got, I would rather sell, I would rather us sell, I say, I mean, I've got 16 players on my list. We're not going to get rid of 16 players, let's be honest. I mean, if we was to get rid of maybe six or seven, but if by getting rid of six or seven, it enabled us to bring in three or four better quality in the areas that we need, that to me will be a good, a good summer window. And I wouldn't be expecting yeah. I'm totally honest. We're not going to bring in six or seven, eight players because we haven't got the money and we're not going to sell 10, 11 players to get it in. We're just not going to do it. We're not going to be able to because no club's got money to buy, have they? That's the problem. It's not, you know, it's, it's not a seller's market, unfortunately, at the moment, really, because clubs haven't got the money to buy what, you, what you've got. So I think if we can get rid of four or five or six and, and bring in two or three better quality in midfield, uh, in, a, in the attacking areas, and we do need cover for left back. And even if that was what all we got, and we've got rid of a few of these players that we don't need particularly that aren't playing much, then I think we'd have to be happy with that. But mm. let's not expect that. This is what I'm saying by a lot of people saying, oh, you know, Arteta needs a transfer window. He needs to say, oh, yeah, you might well need it, but he's not going to probably get it. To the wow, extent this is really... That's the I problem. Mean, Especially if we're not in Europe. Nicolas Arteta's job hasn't been hard enough, right? Um, and we can all make excuses and blah, blah, and everyone's had the same issues to deal with. But when it is your first job, it, it is different, right? And he. Hmm. Even all the, the transfer windows that he's he's had, I mean, are COVID in, uh, affected ones that you can't do a normal normal business. It's just it's it really battling, uh, sort of paddling upstream, really, isn't he? Um, with a lot of the stuff, but we yeah. did have a fairly good window in, in January. Um, I mean, I've got ten players um, on my my sell list. That there's there will be there would be more, but I've really genuinely tried to be realistic. Uh, with the, all the everyone and all the the stuff that I've been thinking about for this this podcast and so on, I try to do it as much as realistically as possible. And Shane's got a really good point there as well. That not only is it going to be a really tough uh, window coming up in the summer with um, clubs being you know, broke after the, the COVID shutdown, but it's also the Euros to to think about as well, which is just I mean utterly ridiculous in my opinion that that's going ahead. I mean, it yeah. could it could yet still be in this country, couldn't it? In which case, I'll probably change my mind a little bit and be quite excited about it if we can go to matches. Oh, but yeah. <laughs> we have to take that as a, as and when it comes. But um, that's going to be a big point as well, you know, because uh, if players, there's always players that uh, either flatter to deceive or obviously have a great Euros and the price suddenly goes up and they're. But clubs, I just can't see clubs having much money to to spend on permanent transfers. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of loans and loan to buys and and all this sort of stuff, and people going on a free. Um, so although I've obviously tried to be really realistic with the players' the prices that I've put down, we'd be lucky to to get rid of half of them for actual permanent fees, won't we? Really. Um, so yeah, we've. I mean, uh, who was it that put a good comment? Yeah, Shane again put a good comment on a, as well about Erdegaard. I mean, there's things like that, that whether we could get an option um, for another lo year's loan with Erdegaard um, with an option to buy after that. But 
Real Madrid are really no, not, they're, 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 they're not in the shit as much as Barcelona, but they they are still in the crap, aren't they? And they want they want to bring in a striker, so they need cash this summer, don't they? I don't think they'll be looking yeah, to do loan outs. We need cash, don't we? We need cash as yeah. well. That's the issue a lot of clubs do. So it's a difficult. It's going to be a difficult market again. It's going to be, and you know, it's going to be hard to get rid of players because who's going to buy them? Who's got the money to buy them? And then if we don't get rid of players and sell them, we're not going to have the money to then invest, reinvest in the squad. And if we're not in Europe, that's going to make the problem even worse, which is why I think it's so important that we are in Europe one way or the other, because the money that we'll get in from that at least might help and it might encourage the owners to, to spend a little bit more knowing that they've got that European money coming in through the season. But it's going to be a difficult market. I actually do feel... I do feel a bit sorry for Mikel Arteta in that in that sense because yeah, me too. It, it's clear that he's got, as we've said, he's got this this way he wants to play, very very clear in his mind the way he wants to play. And for him, it's going to work when he's got certain players who can adapt to that system. And at the moment, he's got a few that can't and haven't been able to. And for him to be able to get all the players in that he needs to make the system work is not going to be possible in this transfer window or possibly the next two transfer windows because of the financial situation of every club in the world. So he's in a difficult situation. I think he's personally he's got to be a little bit more adaptable and understand that and maybe make some changes to the system to suit more of the players that he's he's got and the players that he can afford to buy. But that's, again, that's another issue. But th that I do feel a little bit sorry for him because he is restricted to a certain degree. And maybe other managers in the past haven't had those same problems to deal with. And he's, you no. know, he's... He has got a massive problem this summer because if if we only finish eighth or ninth in the league or wherever it is, which is possible, which is no improvement on last year, in fact, it could even be worse than last year, then if we can't then get the transfer window he wants in the summer, we haven't got European football next season, he's under he's going to be under massive pressure to achieve better results with a squad that's probably not going to be any better. And how's he going to do that? And also, he, sh also, he should have had a full summer um, to spend with the players this year, obviously, obviously apart from their normal uh, holidays, but he should have had a full pre-season. And he's not going to get that. <laughs> he's not going to get that anymore either because of the bloody Euros that were supposed to be on last year are on this year. And so he's still not yeah, going to have I mean, a full pre-season with, with the squad, which is just a real shame. No, no, it, it is. I mean, I, I don't necessarily believe that... Um, a full pre-season or not affects the whole season. I think it affects you at the start of the season. No, no, he's getting his philosophy across. That's the main thing. He's getting his well, yeah, philosophy he's had, across. He's had 18 months to get his, his philosophy across. In training, they train every day, and, you know, yeah, but, most, most of the time through the year, don't they? I know this year was a slightly Yeah, but not, not, not on that sort of thing. That, that, you know, we know that because it's been such a congested season, he's hardly had any of the time to spend on that type of of training because it's, a, it's such a short period of time between matches. You've got a warm down session the day after you don't do a full training session and the season oh, yeah. and the session before a match, you you're pre preparing for that match more than anything. You've only got one day at a time at the most. And that's if you're not traveling somewhere to actually spend on the training pitch to, to, to work on tactics. So he, he hasn't had an awful lot of time at all. He, he could have really benefited from a full pre-season to get that fully drilled into the players. Yeah, maybe. Over. Maybe. I mean, I, I don't know. I think it's... I don't want to use that as a total excuse. Yes, it's been a factor. No, no. No, I'm not. Yeah. I just think but it's a shame. I feel he's yeah. had enough time to have got his ideas across by now, you know, with, with everything that, that's... With the time that he's had with the players on the, on the training pitch and everywhere else, he, he's got enough time. You know, don't forget tactics sometimes are worked on, not always on the training pitch so with, with tactics boards. And you know, you've seen in documentaries and those something mm. like give you insight into how it works. So I think he's had enough time. Um, I just don't, I mean, yeah, like, like I said, I'm, I don't want to come across like I'm making excuses for him. I'm not in the slightest. It would no, have no, just no. been nice. That's all. It would have no, been no, nice for him to have that time. That, more. That, of course, it would, yeah. And it's just it's just sod's law that the way things have worked out that he still yeah. hasn't got a full preseason yeah. in because of the Euros. It's not going to help, and it's not going to. It's going to make no, it's a shame. It a little bit more difficult. It is a shame. I do. Feel, I say I do. I do feel for him because of that reason. But ultimately, I feel as though the the players, some of the players, aren't good enough. And can we get rid of them and replace them with better? That's the problem we've got. And if we can, it's brilliant. If we can't, then unfortunately, where do we go? You know, how are we going to improve results? if we can't improve the, the players in the squad, some of them, which do need 
replacing them because some of them aren't good enough. They're not even some of them aren't even playing, and we're paying them a wage and wage and wage every month, every week, and they're not playing in the team because our team knows they're not good enough, and they can't play the way he wants to play. And it's you know, unless we can sort that out, we're not going to make massive steps forward, are we? Until we can do that, and until we can have no. big massive out of the squad, get money in, and then buy the players that we need, you know, to to better replacements coming in, and. Until we can do that, I fear that we're not going to really, unfortunately, be able to improve much more than, than we can. You know, we're going to struggle to get in the top six. We're going to struggle even more to get in the top four until we can mm. get that. Out. And unfortunately, I don't know when that's going to be, whether it's next year, the year after. It might take us five years now with the recovery from this. I mean, uh, it's, going to, it's going to be really interesting to see because I, I, I honestly would have, and I still am a little bit, but I'll be, I would have been actually really confident if he could have had a full pre-season and, and, and had a good turnaround of staff, you know, playing staff this summer, I really think we would have had a good shout at top four next year. I know I may sound mad, but I, I really do. I, I really do think we would have had a good run at it, genuinely. Um, so I do feel really sorry for, the, for him. For, well, I feel sorry for myself and, and all of us fans more than anything that he's not going to have a full pre-season on the pitch, pitch with the players because I think it, it really does make a difference. And you can say all you like. I mean, James uh, said it just now as well. Uh, training in person is a lot different to doing shit over Zoom. And that's a quite a very eloquent way of putting it, James. And I do agree. Yeah, and it doesn't, you can't make up for it. No, you can't. I mean, that was what that was between March and June, wasn't it? They were doing stuff on Zoom and, and stuff like that. Mm. So that, that affected the end of last season, if anything. And we actually that was useless. Out. Yeah, but we it kind of helped us in a way because we actually improved slightly in the way that we played. We won the FA Cup. Yeah, that hasn't affected this season all that Zoom stuff. No, no. That, but just imagine start. though, if if that had been transferred to actual training on the pitch instead, you know, the difference that that would have made. We, it made a big difference as it was. Because he obviously got his point across very well, but imagine if that tra- it was transferred onto the training pitch, it would have been ten times better, if not more. Uh, and it's, it, it, uh, this is not an excuse; it's just a, it's just un, it's just a shame because we're not going to see the full impact of our ball properly again next season either. I don't think because it's you do need that time with the players and telling them actually in practice on the pitch, what to do and where to where to go in certain situations if you want to get the full time. So it's going to be, a, it is a shame. And I just can't believe that these Euros are still going ahead. It's, it's just utter ridiculous that they're a year late already and they're still going ahead. And no one, people are just seeing them as an inconvenience. They're not, unless you're really massively into your uh, international football, which I certainly not. Um, you know, I, you know, yeah, I, I, same as anyone. If we if we if we start getting carried away like Euro '96 and that, yeah, great, I'm all up for it. But I, I'm not looking forward to these Euros, are you? I mean, it's just going to be a load. Of, it's just trying to squeeze them in for the sake of it. You know, it's, I, mean, it's I, a joke. Yeah, I, I agree. I think you know, obviously, the the World Cup is due next year anyway. Just wait for that. Yeah, early, halfway through the season. Well, yeah, but whatever. There's, there's a World Cup in 2022. Yeah. That was the year it's due. Let's just. Go for that right. World Cup next year. This Euros, unfortunately, should have been last year. We couldn't do it. So, unfortunately, that's that's life. Sometimes these things happen. And just that Euro tournament never happens. And it just gets the next Euro tournament in, in what, three years' time from now would be this one replayed then, at, you know, in, in then. So, whatever countries were hosting it, including us, get that next one and then it just gets all moved along one and that's it that's that's what i have to do that's the sensible thing to do it's madness playing this summer especially is, now yeah. even now you know half of europe's gone back into lockdown who knows what the situation gonna be like in june and july in in the rest of the world we don't we don't know, know. Like it, let alone anywhere else and to get people flying around get, getting teams flying over here us flying over wherever it is it's just crackers it's, i mean playing the european games has been madness enough this season that all european competition should have been but banned this season, definitely. Realistically, all international football should have been banned this season. And well, you know, they should have done it the way they did it last year. That was quite entertaining at the end of the season. Uh, like you know, because there wasn't the Euros, I, that, that was more entertaining when they had the yeah, little was, competitions, yeah, maybe, wasn't it? That was yeah, good. Yeah, maybe maybe you've done that. Yeah, I mean, but yeah. you still you still got the flying around aspect, I guess. But um, but yeah, this season's been they've cared more about the wrong things. They've focused on the wrong things that they should have done this season. 
And it's going to cause, like you said, if, if they play the Euros this summer, which it seems like they are, there's going to be no break again. And players would have played constantly for two years without much of a break at all, apart from the original COVID break when they got three months to to play about on, on Zoom. But other than that, they would have played pretty much constantly for, for two consecutive years in a row, wouldn't they? So you've yeah. three, three seasons in a row when you think about it, but two complete calendars. I think a bit more. Again, I'd, I'll probably go against the grain here when I say this as well. But I, I do think that the the ownership will put some money in. Um, they'll, they'll, I'm sure they'll, they'll want it. Whether they want it back eventually, I don't know. But I do think that they'll put some money in, and they have shown since they had full ownership of the club. To be fair to them, that they've put money in uh, when needed. Uh, the, it's the club's money, but they've they've done things to help us out. Without doubt, since they took full yeah. ownership, um, you know, yeah, two or three yeah. years ago, and I, I do think that that'll continue. I do genuinely think that that will continue. It's just as we've all known, and it's an old cliche now. We put the money in, we spent a lot of money, but we've, we've spent it badly. But I, th- mm. I do think that you can see slight green shoots of that starting to change as well over the last uh, two or three transfer windows. We're starting to bring in the right type of player. And it's always going to be hit or miss when you bring in any any player at all. But um, I do think it's been more hit more um, hit than miss lately with the players that we're bringing in. Mm. And uh, I just wanted to quickly, sh- just before we, we go as well, and if we did get European football, and I know there were some questions earlier on about um, the youngsters and uh, you know the young defenders, especially was was asked about and stuff. But I've just made a, a list of some players that. I think would genuinely be uh, in with a shout of playing in the um, Europa League group stages and the early rounds of the Carabao Cup next year. And it's quite a long list. I, I, I genuinely, I'm really excited about what the academy are doing because the players are getting much better quality that, you know, coming through there. It's, it's really exciting. That guy, uh, this young lad we got from um, Huddersfield, uh, I mentioned him on, uh, Ryan's show yesterday, uh, Tim Akinola. I think he's he's a. I think he's really exciting. He's not uh, you know a massive in stature, but he's a ma- massive of heart. Like I said yesterday, I think he's got a real good bright future if he carries on in the same way. He, he's got a little bit of a tendency to be a little bit rash at times. He's, he, he had a sending off not too long ago, but I think he's a. And this is sound funny. He's, he's a better quality. Although I did like him at the time, uh, Emmanuel Frimpong. I did like him when he started breaking through his attitude and his love for Arsenal and that. But he, yeah, no. you know, he was he was he was very frayed around the edges. I think Tim Akinola is a much more sort of professional, smooth around the edges type of player. But it's got a similar sort of quality, if you know what I mean. I, I think he's uh, one to one to keep an eye out for anyway, and I, and I think he. Uh, would do a good job in the early rounds of the, the Cups. Miguel Aziz, we've, we've already had that conversation. I think he's probably one of the top top uh, players that to come out of that academy. I think he could have a similar impact, you know, to Smith Rowe and, and Saka in the first team, obviously on a different, completely separate part of the pitch and different type of player. But I think he's he could go to the top if we look after him. Uh, Ballard and uh, McGuinness are the closest we've got probably to break through centre-backs. Um, I feel a bit sorry for um, uh, Zach uh, Medley. Um, he, yeah. he's, if he would have made it, he would have made it by now. And I, and, and I don't think, unfortunately, um, the early promise is going to show through to, to actually play for Arsenal. I think he'll probably end up going this summer. But... Um, like I said earlier in the show, and hopefully you might listen back, uh, the people that have joined us late, but McGuinness, I think, is a, is a really good shout to to maybe play some early round cup games. Um, Ballard, he's a very similar level, but I, the only thing that sets him apart for me is, is uh, it's McGuinness's overall attitude. I think he's got a really good, really good attitude. He does remind me of a, a sort of a young Tony Adams in, in that sort of respect. 
Uh, but then we've got Talaji Bola. That jury's out on him. He's, he's very, uh, he's 22 now. Again, similar to Zach Medley. I think he would have weighed it now if he, if he was going to make it. Um, and I believe, like Mike said earlier, his uh, contract is up in the summer. So, unsure um, about him. But Kathleen Serjan, he is similar. It, when I say these comparisons, it's just to give you an idea of the type of player that they are. I'm not saying they're as good, obviously. But Kathleen Serjan, very much like a, a, a Mesut Ozil type player in and around the box. Very, very skillful. Ben Cottrell, although he prefers to play 10, I, I see him as a as a sort of a smaller, diminutive version, but in a similar sort of style to Steven Gerrard, that type of player. Dynamic runs from midfield and, and just sort of having a shot on the edge of the box and uh, the odd one going in and stuff. I see him as that more of a player than a number 10, personally. But uh, again, he's been with a, he's been in and around at the under-23s for quite a while now. And he, although he is a very good player to watch, I don't know whether he will cut it. But um, do I do like him. Uh, very small, uh, diminutive, like I say, smaller stature can get bounced off the ball pretty, pretty easily. Trey Coyle, I like. He reminds me a lot of Kevin Campbell type of player, but he, but you know, he, he can play on the wing as well uh, as a striker. Very powerful, similar in, in sort of person, you know, physical stature to um, Lacazette as well. But I think a bit, maybe a bit taller. Um, I love the goalkeepers, Hein, uh, Carl Hein, and Arthur Conquo. I think it's they're pushing each other. They're both top quality. I think they both could be first team goalkeepers. Clearly, one of them will end up losing the battle and maybe end up moving on. Um, because they won't both want to be uh, sitting around doing nothing. But it's great to to have. I mean, they are probably as good as um, at their age as, as was it, was it Shedney, you know, when he came through uh, as a youngster, he came into the first team at quite a young age and obviously took him maybe a year or two to properly establish himself. But he, he certainly didn't look out of place, did he? He was a quality goalkeeper. I rate them just as highly. I think, I think they could go to, right to the top, both of them. Yes, they're still raw, but they're bound to be, they're only what, 18, 19 years old, but they're, they're already a real big presence, but they're great with their feet as well. And they just, they command their box really well. I, I honestly, when we did have Runison in goal for those few games that he played, I thought, why? I mean, why would, why did we buy him in the first place? Because these two are equally, well, they're loads better than him already uh, at their age, genuinely much better than they hit than him. And the, you just see the difference between the quality, the way that he's so timid and scared. They come out and they command their box already beautifully, as far as I'm concerned. Um, yeah, it's like um, I'm going to come to Joe Joe Lopez, uh, Joe Curry. Uh, he's a, another good. I don't think he's ready for uh, first team exposure in the sort of more in, in, uh, important games. But Joel Lopez is definitely worth uh, giving a few minutes to in the Carabao Cup already. And, uh, you know, again, Euro Europa League group stages. Um, definitely one to watch. Still not quite ready, like I said. But I, def I would start dipping his toe in the water just to get him more and more and more interested and, and give him that carrot to sort of keep pushing and keep pushing to, to improve all the time. I'd say he's at that sort of level at the moment. And uh, James uh, says a conquo out of contract, a conquo out of contract in the summer, isn't he? Sadly, but I don't. I'm not too worried about that. All the rumours are that that's that's all being dealt with, and he will be staying with the club. Um, thankfully, because we stood by, we stood by him. He was out out of um, uh, first team, you know, you know, under twenty three squad for a long time. I believe about twelve to eighteen months with injury. And, uh, yeah, we we really stuck by him throughout that whole period. He's been with the club for many, many years. I think it's no issue with him signing a new contract, thankfully, as well. John Jules as well. He's another one. Uh, very, very similar to what I said about Trey Coyle. I, I think he is 
uh, a very, very similar player. I only think that one of those two will make it as well. Um, because there, there wouldn't be a need for both of them, and they're both very, far too similar. Mm. It's a toss up, really. I think uh, between the two of them, both, I like both of them. And I, 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 there's no point in choosing, but one of them will, will, will sort of push the other one out uh, before too long. Uh, Charlie Patino is the one that everyone uh, is talking about at the moment. Uh, again, in, in style, I would say closest to um, probably maybe a, maybe a Martin Erdegaard st- type of number 10 the, rather than a Meza Ozil type of number 10. Hardworking, very skillful, um, knows where the goal is. He's only 17 and he's made the step up uh, this season now to very recently, two or three weeks ago, uh, to play regular under-23 football now. So playing well above his age group. And um, yeah, he's looking like a a massive, massive um, uh, prospect. I think probably the most exciting, uh, well, since Saka for, for a start, but then going back before that, Jack Wilshire probably talking about him in the same sort of way that Jack Wilshire was when he was when he was breaking through. Kido Kido Taylor Hart is another one. I believe I'm correct in saying he was like um, a football freestyler that caught the eye because he was so good online, right? Um, and got a trial on the back of doing his freestyle work on YouTube or something along those lines. And um, he's just uh, unusually for that type of player that they, they don't know they're normally fantastic when they're doing all those those tricks and skills but when it comes to actually playing football they never really make it as a professional but he's been outstanding on the he's, he's a left winger primarily um but could also play uh through the middle he's actually played in mid- midfield as well at some point in, in his uh youth career but um, I think he's really taken to it when he's playing, cutting in more from the left. And he looks electric. He looks a really good prospect as well. He's a bit of a late bloomer, um, a bit older than the other ones. But I think he, he could actually make it. He's, they're offering him a new contract um, as well. Uh, there's Jonathan Dinsay, who's another centre-back, um, and Omar Rekic. I'm a bit concerned about Rekic, although it's still early days, but we've paid a lot of money for him for a youth player to put him in the under-23s, and he's not played for the under-23s yet, and we've had him since the summer. Uh, no, beg your pardon, since uh, January, um, finally. We bought him in the summer, but he didn't actually join until this January. But he's still yet to make his debut, so I, I hope it's purely down to fitness. But he was playing regular football when we got him. So... It's a bit of a, a weird one. I've not really heard much um, as to the what, what the situation is there in the background. So I'd have to keep an eye on that one. He's obviously well thought of to actually pay the amount of money we did. But Jonathan Dinsay was uh, released by though, them lot down the road. Um, and he's actually been doing quite well. Um, but I don't think he's, he's done quite as well as, as, as we really, really would have hoped. Because he, he does look like a really good uh, player. Um, but maybe it's just a settling in period into a real club after leaving Spurs that's uh, hit him harder than you can imagine because he's playing for a decent football team now. So maybe it's, he's playing a bit of catch up. So we'll have to wait and see on that one. Nikolai Moller is the uh, new Zlatan Ibrahimovic. Yeah, well, um, I, I've still got really high hopes for him. He, he, yeah, he, he's a real presence. He's, uh, it's the big, it's, it's the actual identikit player for the cliche. Great touch for a big man. Um, is it me or is Richard frozen for everyone? Are you there? Can you still hear me, Richard? Yeah. Oh, there you are. You're moving. Yeah. Oh. Nikolai Molle. Yeah. He's a bit great touch for a big man. To, uh, for suits him perfectly. Um, he started off right, and he, everyone was, uh, and myself included, really, really excited about him. Uh, and I still am, but I, I don't think he's quite been as consistent as we would have hoped this season. But I, I don't think the same could be said for the, the under twenty threes team. And I, like I said in the, in Richard, uh, sorry, Ryan show yesterday, I, I hate to say it because I love the guy, but I don't think I don't think Steve Bold is doing a great job in, in coaching them to 
to work as a team, the under-23s anymore. I, I think a lot of the players aren't playing to their absolute old, uh, peak. And it's got to be... Uh, I'm sorry, but the one consistent is, is Steve Bold. And I, I, I absolutely love the guy. But um, I think it's time for a, for a change there. And I would love Dennis Bergkamp to go in and do it. And I, I'll n- not stop saying it until he gets the job. So you'd have to put up with it. Um, but yeah, Nikolai Moller is... Um, He's still a very good prospect. He looks really, really good. He's working as a as a two. They're playing four four two mostly in the under twenty threes, and he's a partner in Balogun, and they play really well together. They complement each other really well. Um, and uh, but I, I think he's just slightly called off. But maybe as I said, it's down to the the team's poor form more than anything. Um, James Olyinko. He was another one we had real high hopes for. He he plays, I think, personally, he plays a lot like Colo Toro, but it, it, in midfield. He's currently on loan at South End and he's been injured since December. But I, he's got to that age as well, early 20, about 20, 21, which obviously is still very, very young. But I think he he's destined to be leaving. And Ozai Tutu, I like him a lot as a player. He reminds me a little bit of, um, not quite as skillful, but the way that he plays is very similar to Lamptey, actually. He's been playing a lot on the right wing more than right back uh, when he's been on loan. He's been doing really well and banging in goals as well, but he's been injured uh, a little bit as well. And um, his contract is up in the summer. I, I'm hoping that we will renew it. Again, just even if he doesn't make it at Arsenal or... Yeah, we don't sort of keep trying to bring him through just to protect our, our asset, really, because he's been with the, the club since he's a little kid and it would be a shame to just see him walk away. But um, I don't know what's going to happen there, to be honest. I would like to keep him. And, and like I said to, uh, earlier in the show, potentially he could be like fourth or, you know, fifth on, in line um, to cover on the right, um, especially in the... Europa League and uh, early cup competitions. So there we have a, a real detailed analysis of, of where we are with the squad after all this period of time. Um, hope you found it interesting, guys and gals that are watching. I know, yes, we are still going, Russ, and we are finishing now. Uh, we're getting into the territory of uh, Ryan's length of show that went on yesterday now. So we're going to call it a day. <laughs> But Richard, listening as well, then that's the main thing. So cheers, Russ. Yeah. No. Have you got anything just to just finish up with? Or are you happy with the way things are? No, no, so, I mean, obviously, we have got some great young players at the club and not all of them are going to make it, of course, because they never do. That's just the nature of it, isn't it? But if one or two of those can have an impact in the first team, similar to the Smith Rowe and, and Saka have done and some a couple of, like, if we can get another couple of them coming through over the next year or so, a couple of years, that would be great, wouldn't it? And it saves you a lot of money. Absolutely. And it does seem as though there's something happening there that hasn't happened for a while in terms of the quality of the younger players that we've got now, uh, whether it's the coaching that they're getting, whether we're just picking better youngsters when they're younger in the first place, the scouting's maybe better. But something's definitely changed and it's good because that's going to be a massively important part of most clubs over the next five years, I think, with the impact of all of this financial stuff that's gone on. So, yeah, it's, it's a, the future in some ways is looking really bright and in other ways I'm worried mm. about where it's going to go. It is, I'm in a little bit of a dilemma with it all, but I guess time will tell how it pans out. But I think it's going to be a difficult couple of years anyway, regardless, if, if we're honest. And we just need to be patient and hope that things turn before too long because um, I want to see another successful, like really successful Arsenal team, at least one more in my life. Oh, definitely. It'd be nice yeah, to I, be that. But, I've never been more confident in the youth coming through. I really haven't. It's been, they're doing the right thing. I mean, Pam Mertesacker yeah, and all the people there deserve a massive, massive pat on the back because yeah. the quality of players coming through lately has been, uh, you know, one of the best in my lifetime since the early 80s, you know, uh, the eighties with all the players that are now household names with all Arsenal fans. Um, it's the best crop since, since then, in my opinion, yeah. I know we've had the odd uh, 
brilliant one in the meantime as well. But um, yeah, it's and I'll tell you what, if we don't qualify for Europe, or if we qualify for that, I'd dread, to, I'd dread it if we did that Europe Europa Conference. I'd really be so humiliated if we do that. But if we if we qualify for that or no Europe at all, I I'll get what we can out of all the players that we want to bring in. But I wouldn't overpay for for them just just to do that. I would much rather go whole hog pretty much and bring all the 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 best of the best of the youngsters through, and just go for it with and, and really try and bring a, a youngsters through for a season. We've got nothing to lose as far as that's concerned. Then, um, maybe, maybe I would try and bring as many as those through as I could, um, and and be done with it. Go for whole hog rebuild for <laughs> you know. Leave no stone unturned to just get rid of every all the other players as as much as we could and just and go with youth, uh, the the best of the best youth that we've got, bring in some uh, the best players that we can, and see what we can do with that lot. Then I think that'd be the ideal opportunity. <laughs> you know, yeah, uh, if it yeah, couldn't maybe. get much worse, could it? If we, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, they could get worse, but yeah, let's not go there. But any, <laughs> anyway, uh. Thanks ever so much again, Rich. You know, and uh, for, it's oh, always fun. a pleasure. Um, tell everyone once show. again how they can get get to see uh, your stuff, which is great. Yeah, the channel's over and over and over again on YouTube. Um, I've tried to keep things as positive as possible. It's not always easy, uh, especially this season. But um, it, it, I, I don't, you know, I try to avoid all the unnecessary kind of bullshit that goes on at other channels, really. So. It's positive stuff on there. I do match reviews, match previews. I have watch alongs. I'll be doing a watch along tomorrow at the Olympiacos game. I've got the fan cam afterwards. Obviously, you're going to be on Andrew, aren't you? And um, there's a few others coming on as well after the game just to get some instant reactions. That'll be good. I'm going to do a watch along with the Arsenal women as well on Friday. They're playing at half past six against Manchester United. Big game to get Arsenal back into the top three for qualifying for Europe. So that's a big game there. So I'm going to be doing a live watch along with that. And then I'll be doing a West Ham pre-match show on Saturday. I've got a West Ham fan on. I used to go to school with him, actually. So it's going to be good to catch up with him and go through because I, I, most people I went to school with a West Ham fan. So um, it'd be good to catch up with him and, you know, go through a few past matches and that kind of stuff. So that'll be that's on Saturday at 7 o'clock. And then obviously Sunday... There'll be a watch along at a West Ham game and hopefully another fan cam afterwards. So those coming up on the channel as well. So it's over and over and over again, the Positive Arsenal channel on YouTube. And on Twitter, it's at Over and Arsenal. And my personal Twitter is at Greenwich B. And I post all the links and stuff uh, on there as well. So you can keep up to date with what's, um, yeah. what I'm doing. Great. Uh, it's a great channel. You know, I'm always very, very happy to when you invite me on now i'd love to go on your channel as well so please everyone go and check it out if you haven't done so already and uh, give rich a subscribe so you don't miss all those shows that he's got coming up and um yeah i've got i just keep my fingers crossed that there's <laughs> no natural tragedies or anything like that or any any kind of tornadoes or whatever that yeah. may stop uh graham ricks coming on next uh next week but it's confirmed for next wednesday so fingers crossed everyone Positive vibes that that will happen um, next week. So that should be a really good show. Um, thanks. Please give us a like before you leave. Uh, tell your friends and to subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And um, yeah, we'll leave it there. Thanks. Ever. I mean, the, the comments have been fantastic today. So thanks to all of you in the chat. Uh, it's really appreciated. Hope we got through most of them as we've been uh, working our way through. Um, and once again, before we finish, up the Arsenal. See you next week. Gunners, come on. Up the Arsenal. Come on, you Gunners. Come on, you Gunners. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Thank you for listening to From Dial Square to Air. Please help us grow by giving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and following the show on your preferred podcast platform. Please also visit our Facebook page, our Twitch channel and of course our YouTube channel, and whilst you are there, please subscribe and hit the notification button so you don't miss any upcoming shows. Please also press the like button on the video so we can get recommended by YouTube to other Arsenal fans all around the world. See you soon.
Thank you for listening to From Dial Square to Air. Please help us grow by giving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and following the show on your preferred podcast platform. Please also visit our Facebook page, our Twitch channel and of course our YouTube channel, and whilst you are there, please subscribe and hit the notification button so you don't miss any upcoming shows. Please also press the like button on the video so we can get recommended by YouTube to other Arsenal fans all around the world. See you soon. Thank you.